particular electron would enter the atmosphere and where it deposits its energy. Um, and of course, how does this occur? Well, the main cause are geomagnetic storms. And I probably don't have to tell this community that, but uh, geomagnetic storms tend to cause most of the electron precipitation. Uh, this just gives some, some basic facts that I'm sure we all know. You know, they're caused by CMEs and solar wind. Uh, it causes the change of the, the BZ magnetic field, promotes the instability of the radiation belts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for the source of medium energy and high energy electrons, and I, I want to distinguish that from auroral electrons, these tend to be radiation belt electrons. Um, and in particular, what causes radiation belt electrons to get into the atmosphere are pitch angle scattering from wave particle interactions. Um, in particular, chorus waves, ULF waves, plasmospheric hiss, emic waves. This is from um, Milan and Thorne, 2007. And it's just a nice overview of the frequency of all the waves during um, an AE index period uh, on uh, September 12th in 1990. Um, and it mostly just tries to summarize the idea that these waves tend to cause pitch angle scattering. And then this causes these electrons to fall into the atmosphere where um, chemistry changes and other things can happen. And, and that's kind of the focus of, of this talk is once the electrons get into the atmosphere, what, what happens then? So obviously the, the motivation of the talk is why is it important for the atmosphere? Um, and I think, this plot here on the left, um, it, it, it summarizes all of the particle precipitation from galactic cosmic rays through solar EUV and X-rays. And this actually was adapted from Lean 1994 because this medium and high energy electron red shade was never in there before. Because previously it was thought that the main impacts from particle precipitation were protons and aurora electrons. And now we are discovering that these medium and high energy electrons are also important for the middle atmosphere. Um, so we, we've adapted this by adding this nice red shading in here to show the ionization rate that occurs from when electrons precipitate in the atmosphere and what altitudes they're important at. And why it's important is because when the particles come into the atmosphere, it changes the chemistry. And in particular, it changes the chemistry of NOx and HOx, which is odd nitrogen and odd oxygen. And odd, odd oxygen or HOx, uh, it, that's really one of the major impacts you see initially or what, what's called as the direct impact because it'll create that chemistry where the electrons uh, deposit their energy. So it tends to be in the mesosphere as shown in this plot here. And there is mesospheric ozone which is often then destroyed by the, the Hox chemistry generated from the electrons. But the NOx chemistry is much more interesting because in the polar winter, uh, NOx isn't destroyed by light. Typically, if you generate NOx in the summertime from energetic electrons, the, the light will destroy most of the NOx very quickly. However, in the wintertime when there is no light, NOx is actually controlled dynamically and can descend from the mesosphere as shown here into the stratosphere where it can destroy ozone. And in particular, um, the ozone destruction can cause a lot of other changes, which I wanna to touch on uh, briefly before going into some of the modeling studies. So this is an all encumbering busy plot of the effects of, of energetic particles on the entire system. And it's long been thought that energetic particle precipitation is important for ozone chemistry in the middle atmosphere. And that's absolutely true. The ozone is one of the big reasons why this is, this is funded. This is why we, we care about this stuff. But in addition to that, we've started to, to discover that changing the ozone in the stratosphere actually has impacts, not just on the ozone, but also on the temperature and the wind field of the stratosphere. And why this is important is because it actually can modify the wave activity in the stratosphere. And that's what's shown with these squiggly lines in purple and red here, is that these purple lines are gravity waves and the red lines are planetary waves. By modifying the, the temperature and wind structure of the, of the stratosphere, you actually modify the gravity waves that are coming up 
from the troposphere. And we've noticed that the gravity waves actually can have impacts on the ionosphere. Uh, and by modifying or amplifying these gravity waves in the stratosphere, you actually can have impact the ionosphere thermosphere system through the changing of the chemistry of the stratosphere. Um, and to, to try to show this in a, in a, in a movie format, um, this shows a, um, an animation from uh, Yaga Richter from NCAR, and this shows a wind field here. So what's shown is from zero to 100 kilometers, there's 30 meter per second winds everywhere, except for down in the troposphere where it mellows out down to zero. And what you can see here is a little topographical feature to generate gravity waves. And the importance of this video before I play it is just to show that gravity waves can impact the entire atmosphere uh, through the, their propagation. So by modifying these gravity waves, you could actually modify other regions of the atmosphere. So this shows a movie of how, how broad the scale is of, of the impacts of gravity waves. And these are what's called um, a singular gravity wave. So there's no secondary or tertiary gravity waves in this model. And you can see large impacts on the wind fields all the way up to the mesopods here around 80 or 90 kilometers. So by modifying the, the gravity wave in the stratosphere from energetic particle precipitation, we think we can actually modify the ionosphere response to gravity waves. And this next plot I, I, is, is, there's too many words on it, but the, the main idea is that in addition to these primary gravity waves that we, I just demonstrated in that video, there's been work by uh, Sharon Vadas and, and Eric Becker and others that have looked at these secondary gravity waves, these launching, you know, once these gravity waves break near the mesopause, for example, they actually can launch secondary and tertiary gravity waves that can then move on to, to have other impacts. Um, and in particular, down here, I, I, I want to focus on, they've actually seen evidence that suggests the F region gravity waves from sources other such as wind flow over the mountains and imbalances of the jets are higher order gravity waves. In other words, they're secondary and tertiary gravity waves impacting the F region of the ionosphere. So that means if we can change the gravity waves in the stratosphere and, and the mesosphere, then we could change gravity waves all the way up through the ionosphere. Additionally, there's been work that shows the energetic particle precipitation impacts the troposphere as well. This was a, a study done by Rosanoff in 2005 using um, the University of Illinois um, uh, coupled climate model. And it shows th this is a, a forced run with and without energetic particle precipitation, in particular, electron precipitation. And you can see here on the left is a height plot and a, a latitude plot that shows the impacts of NOY. Uh, uh, the force minus the baseline. So this would be the, the direct impacts of the particle precipitation. And the shaded regions are statistically significant. And you can see the, the change in NOY impacts the ozone shown in the middle plot, uh, which is shown shaded in a percentage. And then over to the right, you can see the change in temperature. And if you focus on the, the Southern hemisphere, you can see these temperature changes that are statistically significant down to about 500 hectopascals, which is where the jet stream exists, the bottom of the jet stream. So this kind of illustrates that we can also see impacts all the way down to the, to the surface. Um, another paper was done by Annika Sapella in 2009, looking at ERA-40 data, so reanalysis data that shows surface temperatures associated between years of high AP and low AP that you can see at the top is the Southern Hemisphere. So this is June, July, August, which is the, the Southern Hemisphere winter. Um, you can see temperatures of plus or minus 5K at the surface with differences between the years of high AP and low AP. And likewise, if you look at the Northern Hemisphere in December, January, February, you also can see these types of temperature changes. So just, just to a knowledge assessment here, you know, we know what electron precipitation is. We know what causes it qualitatively. We know it's, it's magnetospheric waves that cause pitching or scattering. And we know it's important for the middle atmosphere chemistry. 
But it's important to note that we we don't know uh, in terms of, of quantitative uh, impacts on the other regions of the, the atmosphere, things like the troposphere, things like the ionosphere and thermosphere. But then again, how do we model this? How, how would we model electron precipitation? So the first thing you need is to measure electron precipitation. And to do that, you need a satellite or some sort of parameterization. But in this case, we're gonna focus on satellite measurements. And one of the most popular ones to use is the pose MEPHEAD uh, satellites, which um, part of that reason is they've been running for a very long time and they have semi-global coverage. And, and both of these reasons make them ideal um, instruments to, to model precipitation because we, we can look at more of a global precipitation map, which is what I'm gonna go through here is how we go from the count rates to a precipitation map that we can use in a modeling study. So just some, some details that I think are important. The original instrument has three electron channels, three integral channels. What that means is there's a, a greater than 30 keV, a greater than 100 keV, and a greater than 300 keV uh, channel in terms of the electron channels. The, the other important aspect is this 90 degree and zero degree detector. And what that means is at high latitudes, the zero degree detector looks straight down the magnetic field line. So it's measuring primarily precipitating electrons. Whereas the 90 degree detector is, as the name suggests, 90 degrees offset from the zero degree detector. So at high latitudes, the 90 degree detector is measuring trap flux and the zero degree detector is measuring precipitating flux. But this changes, the orientation of the satellite changes as it goes to the equator where the opposite is true. And the reason why this is important is there's several POSE MEPED data sets and some use both detectors and some only use the zero degree detector. And, I, and as we move forward, you'll see why that's important in terms of, of the ionosphere or the ionization impacts on the atmosphere. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the nice thing about POSE is it has semi-global coverage. Um, it's, it's better than, and, than other instruments that are measuring electron precipitation. This is just a, a movie that shows the satellite zipping around and where they are at at any given point in time. Um, but like any other instrument, POSE has problems as well. And one of the big problems with POSE is proton contamination exists and it, it causes protons to sneak into the electron detectors. So one of the first things you have to do is remove this proton contamination from the count rates. And it's not trivial because the protons that contaminate the electron channels span several of the, the proton channels. So you can't just take one proton channel and subtract what we think to one of the electron channels. Instead, you have to, you have to do some sort of methodology to uh, remove this proton contamination. And the data sets that exist all do different things, which results in different results, as you'll see um, shortly. What we do in our data set is we create a differential proton spectrum using P1 through P5 channels, and then we integrate between the two energy channels where the, the contamination is happening. That's our method. Whether it's the best method is unknown because nobody's ever compared the different methods uh, to truth, but that at least we are accounting for it in some regard. And it can be significant. So what's shown here on the left is, is the three, the E1, the E2, the E3 channels. And shown in red is the corrected counts and shown in black is the uncorrected counts. And obviously here it's difficult to see the black, but on some measurements, it's very obvious to see the black. And this is a log scale of electron count rate. Um, so you can see, for example, in the E2 channel here that measures greater than 100 keV electrons, it can be as much as a factor of two or three in count rates between the corrected and the contaminated. So it's very important using the pose MEPAD data to, to correct for this. One benefit though is <laughs> The relativistic electrons contaminate the P6 channel in the POSE um, instrument, in the MEPED instrument. So we also get a bonus high energy channel 
during periods of time where there are no protons precipitating. So this is uh, maybe not the best plot to show this, but this just shows the first few months of 2004, and it shows um, a one of the uh, proton channels that shows nothing going on. Uh, uh, that's what's indicated by the blue. And here on the right shows this P6 channel that seems to see a lot of things going on. And we think this can be used as a proxy for these relativistic electrons. So now that we, we have this bonus channel, we actually have an E1 and E2 with E3 and this virtual E4 channel, which gives a, an energy coverage from about 25 keV through about 10 MeV. So that's a good range, right? It, it, it bumps up against the rural electron precipitation all the way through relativistic electron precipitation. Now that you have these three, these four channels though, you have four points on a graph. So you have to fit this somehow. You have to fit a spectrum to it. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Some people use power laws, some people use energy exponentials. We use a linear combination fit. And we recently did a large statistical analysis of this where we compared using uh, root mean square error values for both the zero degree detector and the 90 degree detector for the four different individual spectral fits as well as a linear combination of all four. Um, and what that means is instead of just using a, a one particular spectrum, like a power law, for example, shown in red, we use a linear combination of all four. Um, and what this, what this guarantees essentially is we will always have a better fit than any individual spectrum. And that, that's the goal here. Um, there's, uh, there's different ways to do this. Some people use piecewise polynomials. There's a number of different ways, but we've found that the combined spectrum statistically is the best fit in terms of root mean square error. Um, I just wanted to illustrate that on how we fit, you know, how we go from four different um, channels to a, a fully differential electron flux. Now, of course, as I mentioned, there's an issue between differentiating between trapped and bounced loss cone flux or precipitating flux. And one of the problems that I mentioned early on that I would come back to is the fact that if you only use the zero degree detector in pose, you underestimate the electron flux. And this is a, a, a plot from Craig Roger in 2010. And this dashed line shows what the zero degree detector is measuring. And then the solid line shows what the bounce loss cone size is. So it should be clear from this that you're going to underestimate this. But one of the problems with using the 90 degree detector is that it's measuring mostly trap flux at these higher latitudes. And this plot is attempting to illustrate this. Um, the, the, this is a pitch angle and then magnetic latitude is on the bottom. And the red line shows the 90 degree detector's pitch angle and then the zero degree pitch angle is shown in blue. And then the bounce loss cone angle is shown in green. So the way to interpret this is anything underneath this green line we think is precipitating. So you can see that at the high latitudes, the, the, red, the red curve or the 90 degree detector is measuring trapped while the blue is measuring precipitating. But as you get towards mid latitudes, this, this switches. So you have to figure out a way to determine what is precipitating and what's trapped between the two. And it's a complicated mathematical procedure that I'm happy to go into if anybody has questions on it. Uh, the paper that I put out uh, last year um, talks about it in gory detail, so feel free to refer to that as well. But the point is, it's better to use both detectors ab aboard pose than just one, because if you just use the zero degree, you will underestimate the flux. So just another assessment here. We use the pose MEPET instruments to measure the electrons. We have to remove the proton contamination from the electron channels first. And then we have to choose a best spectral fit to go from the electron count rates that come with pose to a differential electron flux, but more than that, a precipitating flux. And we use both the detectors to estimate that. Now this is great, but now we need to figure out how to get this into a model. And the way to do that is we have to create precipitation maps. Now, historically, this has been done using L shell, some sort of zonal average on L shell. So it kind of resembles what an aurora oval would look like. The problem with this is we know that medium and high energy precipitation 
um, it doesn't really look like the oval does. So we've tried 2D interpolations using pose, but we've actually settled on a better method using uh, Delaney triangulation. Now what's shown here on the left is the MEPED bounce loss cone flux. So the, this is actually the, the paths of the different MEPED instruments for one single day. So that's what all these different lines are. So this is what it would look like um, if you just use the data. Now to make a map out of it, we use Del Delaney triangulation, which is shown in the middle here. Um, and, and to kind of test how well this works, is we overplotted this left-hand plot onto the middle plot in hopes that it would disappear in a sense of how well, how well the fit is working. And we think it's doing a pretty good job. And most importantly, it captures features that a zonal average would not. So for example, chorus waves tend to pre precipitate electrons between say six and 12 MLT, right? So the nice thing about this is this could capture this better than just doing a zonal average over an L shell or over a magnetic latitude. And I just wanted to mention, I, this is not the only game in town. There's several different MEPED based electron data sets that exist. This was a paper uh, that I was a part of that was published last year, or it actually might've came out early this year, that we, we compared eight different pose based MEPED data, data sets. And you can see these top ones, these top five use only the zero degree detector. And these are ionization rates for, for the record, but that's a proxy for electron flux. And you can see that these five on the top have less ionization than the three on the bottom that all use the zero and 90 degree detectors. But nonetheless, there's a big difference between them, uh, which, which we can talk about towards the end. But um, this is my older version of the data set, the MP15 data set um, that, I, that I entered into this, this particular paper. But I just wanted to highlight that there are more than just my data set that exists. Um, so to get into the modeling, uh, we wanted to do an easy case study first with this data set. So we picked the 2003 Southern Hemisphere winner. We did this because it was active, so there was a lot of precipitation, but also because the Southern Hemisphere winner is quiet dynamically. It, it, it's very calm in the sense that there's not a lot of um, crazy dynamics going on. Um, unfortunately, we have to, we can't measure electrons directly in the atmosphere, so we have to use a proxy. And NOx is the best proxy for validation. Um, so, in other words, you know, we we plug this in the model and then we we look at NOx, what's coming out of the model, and compare it with observations. And one thing to note that as I mentioned briefly earlier, NOx descends routinely uh, into the stratosphere in the polar region. So what this shows is a MEPAS limb sounding observation of NOx descending um, in the early part of the winter in the Southern hemisphere here, you know, everything above say 50 kilometers is, is in the mesosphere. And you can see it descend into the stratosphere throughout the winter time due to the fact that it's dynamically controlled and there's no light to destroy the NOx. Of course, you need a model to model, and we here use the whole atmosphere community climate model. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this model, it's a fully coupled climate model that uses D region chemistry, uh, ion cluster chemistry. Uh, it has great resolution. There's a lot of bells and whistles for it. In this particular study, we used, um, we used four different simulations, a baseline simulation, we use the CMIP-6 forcing uh, by Max Vandekamp, uh, which is uh, a common one to be used. Uh, I used my old data set, the MP15, and then my upgraded data set um, as forcing. We did apply specified dynamics. What that means is the, the bottom of the model all the way up to say the, the top of the stratosphere, lower mesosphere is constrained by the MARA-2 data. Um, this allows us to look at just the chemistry changes and not have to worry about the dynamical changes that are occurring. And we ran the model from January 1st through, um, actually it was the end of October, but um, through, through the uh, beginning of the springtime in the Southern hemisphere. We used an auroral parameterization that's commonly used uh, by Robo and Ridley, and we used uh, some SPE input, input as well. And I wanted to highlight this plot here because I think it's important to note why we need to do this. 
So here on the left are me, P, these are uh, NOx mixing ratios from me pass. Me pass again is observations. Um, it's a limb sounding instrument that measures um, globally. So this is from 60 to 90 south. Um, this is the same plot as I showed here, um, just slightly different um, location. So what this shows is the observations, what, what assuming the observations are truth, this is what actually is happening. And on the right is what Wacom would output without any energetic electron precipitation. And it should be clear that it's grossly underestimating the amount of NOx reaching the stratosphere. And that's why we're doing this. We, we, we want to get the chemistry right because we know the chemistry impacts the ozone, which impacts the temperature and the winds, et cetera, et cetera. So what does it look like as a whole? So this again is the same plot I keep showing of me pass. Um, so these are the observations. This is what we want to match. On the top right here is the CMIP6 parameterization. Uh, on the bottom left here is my previous version of the data set. And on the bottom right is my updated version. And this is zonally average between 60 and 90 south. So it should be clear right away that CMIP6 is underestimating. This in part is because it only uses the zero degree detector. Um, the MP15, my previous one, is also slightly underestimating. We think this could be due to the mapping procedures that we were originally doing with this. And then my newest one looks good at 50 kilometers, but it looks like it's slightly overestimating as well. So um, it's not perfect, but we think it's doing a better job than the previous data set and especially over the CMIP6 parameterization. And when we go to lower latitudes between 40 and 50 south, um, the distinction is especially clear. So here on the top left is the MEPAS observations again. The black line is to guide the eye on what, what we should be seeing from the rest of the simulations. Um, CMIP6 doesn't even come close. MP, MP15 does better but you can see the MPE does really well um, at the mid-latitude range. And we think this has a lot to do with our new mapping procedure. Um, this is another way to show it, but in difference plots. So this just shows the baseline relative to MEPAS, CMIP6, MP15, and MPE. Um, again, the MPE shows a much better comparison at these mid-latitudes um, than the other simulations that are being forced with other electron parameterizations. And of course, the whole game here is to see the impacts on ozone because that's what's driving everything else. So this just shows the background ozone concentration. And then top right, we see the, the CMIP6, which doesn't show much. We get a little bit of blue here from the OH destruction, but not very much being descended into the stratosphere to destroy any ozone. MP15 does show some. And then of course, we see MPE shows a lot more ozone destruction than the other simulations, which means it's gonna probably have more impacts on other layers of the atmosphere. Um, but this was an easy one. This was a softball study because there was no problems with it. So we wanted to test it a little better here. And we, we looked at the 2004 Northern Hemisphere winter. And if you're unfamiliar with this particular winter, it had ex extremely crazy dynamics. It had record levels of NOx being brought into the stratosphere due to a sudden stratospheric warming, followed by what's referred to as an elevated stratopause event. For the sake of, of brevity, it's just essentially enhanced descent into the stratosphere. And this is from Cora Randall's 2015 paper that shows the MEPAS observations on the left and what Wacom is showing on the right. And it's pretty clear that it's not even close, uh, particularly in these early months of 2004. Um, and this just shows to emphasize that elevated stratopause events um, definitely contribute to elevated amounts of NOx in the stratosphere. I, I won't go too deep into this, but this is just the, the red lines show um, years with elevated stratopause events and the fact that you can see these NOx tongues in every year that we had one. Um, so this is Cora's 2015 paper using four solar occultation instruments, HALO, SAGE-2, SAGE-3, and POEM-3 are shown in black, while the Wacom simulation without any energetic electron precipitation is shown in red. And it should be clear that it's not very good. Um, the observations in HALO and SAGE, as well as POEM and SAGE-3, we just, we don't see it. We don't get these, these elevated, um, 
NOx or NO2 values that are shown in the observations. And we thought this has to be the, the energetic electron precipitation. So we just did a study that we're hoping to publish shortly where I copied these same plots, but used my MPE data set into Wacom. And while it looks better, it's still not there. Um, it looks pretty good in Halo, not great, but it looks better. But if you look at Sage 2, Poem 3, I apologize for the terrible color here, um, and, and Sage 3, you can see that we're still not capturing the amount of NO2 seen in the model. And we think this actually is related to the gravity wave parameterization that occurred in the model, um, which I will talk about a little more at the end here. But the, the point of this was we wanted to test this, the model especially. And I think it's very common with case studies to focus on time periods that are easy, um, that, that are going to show good results. But we wanted to really test the model and test our data set well. And no, no model has ever been able to reproduce 2004. So we thought this was a great opportunity to try it. And, you know, unfortunately, but also fortunately, we did not see. So we know that there's still improvement needed in the model, but that's okay, because that's the whole goal of this is to move the model forward. What about long-term studies? So Long-term studies are different because you have to run the model a very long time. You need validation for a very long time, which means you need instrumentation and observation for a very long time. But there has been some studies done. Uh, this was by uh, Ji He Li uh, from Korea. This was a um, simulation using CMIP-6, which we know underestimates, but that's okay. Uh, using Wacom 6D, this came out uh, just last year. And then the top panels in both the Northern Hemisphere shown on the left and the Southern Hemisphere shown on the right are uh, the baseline simulation. So there's SPEs that you can see with these red lines shooting down, but there is no MEE. The middle panels show the MEE and then the bottom panels show the relative difference. So it should be clear that there's a lot more um, uh, NOx mixing ratios when you include MEE, which should be clear at this point. But in particular, you can see the altitudes that they reach, which, you know, in some cases in the, in the Southern hemisphere where you have the strong polar vortex, you can get down to 30 kilometers with this NOx, which is, you know, close to ozone uh, layer level. And they went on to show this, this uh, synergy between the NOx, the temperature, the winds, um, and the ozone. So here we see, um, this, is, this is the Southern hemisphere. You can see this ozone destruction in May, June, and July, and August. So this is focused on the Southern hemisphere winter. You get this ozone destruction from the descending NOx, which in result changes the temperatures, which in result changes the winds. Um, and you might ask, why don't you see any changes down below 60 kilometers? And this goes back to the fact that they use specified dynamics WACM. And that means the model is constrained below about 55 kilometers. So you're not gonna see any changes. Um, that's a still open question on how it impacts say the stratospheric climate. But nonetheless, I think this is a great study that highlights the fact that when you change this ozone due to the energetic electrons, you definitely change the temperature and you definitely change the winds, which then is gonna change the gravity wave um, uh, modification as well as possibly planetary wave issues down below. Now, this isn't gonna show that of course, because of the, the dynamics, but um, I think it still highlights the fact that um, you, you can change the dynamics by changing the ozone. And this is, this is using Wacom. So we wanted to do a similar study. Um, so we, this is a study that um, we're doing currently uh, where we ran Wacom from 2003 through 2021. And we did a baseline simulation, much like the previous study. And then we used the MPE, which we know has more ionization than the CMIP-6 parameterization. So what's shown here is the ionization rates within the baseline simulation. So these red streaks that you see are solar proton events. So this is without MEE currently. And down here in the, the troposphere, lower stratosphere, are galactic cosmic rays. And on the right here, if your pressure um, unit challenged. I added the altitudes uh, for reference. And I want to go back and forth between this plot and the next plot because I think it highlights just how much ionization uh, medium energy electrons can put into the atmosphere. 
So this is the same plot, but using the MPE ionization uh, rates from, from the force run. So going back and forth, the, the SPEs stay the same because there's nothing changing with the SPEs. However, you can see at this 60, 55, 60 through 100 kilometer range, there's a lot more ionization being put into the model that is missing if you don't include it due to these electrons. And it's, it's so important for, for the chemistry. And to highlight that, this is what the NOx chemistry looks like in the Southern Hemisphere polar region in the baseline simulation. Um, you know, just to point out some features, these uh, tongues that come down are the polar winter um, every year that it, it systematically comes down. Um, but if you add the, the ionization from MPE into it, this is what you get. So if I, if I flip back and forth, you can see just how much, not just more NOx you see in the middle atmosphere and the mesosphere, but also down below one hectopascal, which is in the stratosphere. And that's important because the stratosphere is where most of the ozone is, and that's where we'll see most of the ozone destruction. And you can see just way more, um, and, and, and and to look at this as a difference plot, you can see it here. This is in mixing ratios. Um, you can see just how much more NOx is coming down, particularly during the years where there is uh, uh, more energetic precipitation. So you can almost follow the solar cycle here. Um, there's solar declining, solar max, and then solar min, and then solar max. Um, and this continues out if I were to show the, the last six years of the simulation as well. But this, you know, this is a lot more NOx entering into the stratosphere, which means you're going to destroy more ozone. So here's a, uh, the ozone plot. So this is actually just the background mixing ratios of ozone. You can see the ozone layer here shown in the reds. Um, you can see the mesospheric ozone layer that is a, um, a yearly thing that occurs during the winter. Um, that shows up and then you have, well, this is actually like lower thermosphere and then the mesosphere one. And this is the ozone destruction. Uh, so this is the, the forced minus the baseline run shown here on the left as a function of altitude and time throughout the 15 years or 14 years shown in this, this particular plot. And you can see just how much ozone is being destroyed in terms of percent difference. And if you look at, for example, in 2003, you're seeing as much as 10 to 20%, maybe more ozone destruction at locations where the ozone layer is. In other words, you're seeing significant ozone destruction um, simply from bringing more NOx from the middle atmosphere down. And on the right just kind of shows a qualitative percent difference, but it's, it's averaged over the entire time period, which means it's going to, it's not going to have the same impact if I were to use say a seasonal average instead of a yearly average here, but it still indicates that a lot more ozone destruction occurs in the model um, due to the fact that we're, we're adding these electrons in. Now we're still under the validation phase right now. We're still working on validating this with observations. It's difficult because it's difficult to find an observational, um, you know, some sort of satellite that measures for 20 years. So you have to piece these all together. So this is in the process. We're hoping to get this paper out by the end of the year that shows the long-term impacts. But nonetheless, I wanted to highlight some of the recent results. So to overall, to summarize, where are we at? So the electron data sets, they need more work. Um, there's several that exist. Um, and despite the fact that we all use the same instrument, we have different results. Um, so I think more validation for this needs to occur to help improve what we're putting into the models. Um, I wanted to promote the GDC mission that's coming up here because that's going to measure auroral electron precipitation, which is typically parameterized. So if the GDC mission goes forward, we will actually get global auroral precipitation of maps as well, which will also be great for thermospheric and ionospheric chemistry changes. Um, in terms of the case studies, I think it's important to note that there's a lot of case studies using electron precipitation that are out there. Um, however, I think, I don't wanna say they cherry pick, but I think most pick periods that are either dynamically quiet or are easy to study. And I think it's important to, to model periods that aren't as easy. For example, 
like the 2004 Northern Hemispheric winter, when the dynamics were crazy, just to see how well the model's doing. And we can still see here that if you just look at all the other case studies and say, well, these all look great, why do we need to keep moving forward on this? I think if you look at these other periods, you can see that the models still need more work. Possibly the electron data sets need more work. Um, and it, it's not Wacom's fault. To date, no model has been able to reproduce the chemistry well during elevated stratopause events, but it's something to think about. And it's something I think we need to highlight more is model deficiencies so we can get better in terms of our, our modeling of these. In terms of long-term studies, I don't think there's been enough done. There has been a few, but they're difficult to validate. Most use specified dynamics. And I think the problem with that is when you constrain the lower stratosphere, the, the stratosphere in general, the problem is you end up preventing to see the impacts on the troposphere system um, as a result. So I think it would be great for someone to do a long-term study of the impacts of MEE um, using a free running model just to see how well the troposphere, you know, how much the troposphere might change due to this, um, the MEE impacts from the stratosphere. Um, and I want to leave with some open questions. First of all, I think it's important, as I just mentioned, how does the EEP contribute to climate of the stratosphere and the troposphere? We've seen regional changes in the troposphere due to changing ozone in the stratosphere, but I don't think there's any, any definitive studies, particularly long-term studies that have shown, um, you know, if you're pummeling the atmosphere for 10, 15 years with electron precipitation, changing the stratosphere, how does this contribute to changes in the troposphere? Um, second, one thing to highlight, you know, the gravity wave modification is absolutely important, but models right now don't have secondary and tertiary gravity waves in them. Now that's a problem, of course, because it's not gonna show the impacts on the ionosphere, but nonetheless, I think gravity waves are a challenge for any modeler. And I think the fact that the energetic electron precipitation can modify gravity waves compounds that issue. But I still think it's important because what kind of impacts does it have on the ionosphere or thermosphere is still an open question because we don't have models that can produce the gravity waves we need and how it ties back into the electron precipitation as a whole. And then lastly, and this is, this is my promotion um, for white papers that are coming up in a couple of weeks that are due. Um, the only two instruments that we currently have in the mesosphere measuring are SABER and MLS, uh, microwave limb sounder and then SABER. Um, and both of those are on the chopping block in terms of, of funding cuts through NASA. And the unfortunate thing is, if we lose those instruments, then the mesosphere goes dark. We, we will not have any, AIM will exist, but AIM measures um, noctilucent clouds and gravity waves. So we won't have any chemistry observations in, in the mesosphere. And I think it's important uh, moving forward is you can't validate a model without observations. Um, so without observations, we can't see how well our models are doing. So I think it's important to promote the continuation or new missions to measure uh, atmospheric chemistry, particularly in the mesosphere. And with that, uh, I thank you for some of your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Josh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, that was really great. Uh, we do have a couple questions that are coming in now. Uh, the first one is from Hugh Hudson. Uh, this is a rather difficult question. Uh, Generally speaking, how is electron energy divided up among waves, flows, and radiation? Stu, um, that, that is a great question. Um, generally speaking, um, I don't think that's well known. Um, when, you, when you model an electron into the atmosphere, you're not really modeling an actual electron coming into the atmosphere. Usually it's some sort of a, this many electrons means this much chemistry change. So it's not as if we're, we're modeling the electron coming into the mesosphere. It's like, okay, we, we take how much electron flux we have, and then we're gonna change that into what we think based on some branching ratio 
the NOx chemistry or the HOx chemistry or the ozone chemistry changes from this electron flux. Um, so I don't <clears throat> think it's necessarily that, that it is divided up um, because I don't think the models have been sophisticated enough to bring the electrons in themselves yet. It's all just a parameterization essentially at the end of the day. Hopefully that answers the question because um, in terms of, of radiation and, and things of that nature, you know, Bremstrong X-ray radiation, that kind of stuff, that's still possible, but I don't think those are in models either. So I think right now it's, the models have been simplified too much to divide that up. If I could ask uh, verbally, uh, just one continuation. Yeah. Uh, the, how about the waves? I mean, the gravity waves are not driven by chemistry, are they? No, the gravity waves are parameterized um, once you reach the limit of the resolution of the model. So there are gravity wave codes um, that are written into say like Wacom, for example, that can internally resolve gravity waves um, up to the resolution of the model. But once you get below the resolution of the model, you have to do some sort of parameterization for these. Yeah, no, but the amplitude of the waves. Yes, so th the amplitude is coded in there. And actually, um, I glossed over this, but the model that we just did in the 2004, we actually um, increased the amplitude of the waves to try to get more descent down from the, the, the thermosphere, but we were unable to get the, the proper chemistry. Okay, thanks. Uh, so our next question comes from Jason Durr. Um, how sensitive are atmospheric dynamics, uh, such as gravity waves and propagation, or chemistry to the specific location or isolation of electron injections? I think that's exactly an open question that we're, we're looking to solve. Um, it was unfortunate, um, the wave NASA drive proposal um, that was at LASP um, wasn't funded, but I, I, I don't think it's gonna stop the, the research, but I think it's, it's just gonna slow down the research. But I think one of the main things they wanted to look at was um, how these gravity waves uh, change due to geomagnetic forcing and radiative forcing, and particularly at these sublocations. Um, I think the problem is right now, gravity waves haven't, I don't think they're well resolved in models. And I, and I hate to say that because I'm sure there's, there's people that they spend their whole lives on this. And, but I think it's a difficult problem to solve. Um, and I think right now we just don't, we don't know that question. And I think we need to go after those types of questions on how gravity waves impact the chemistry. And like you just said, this specifically at what location, say you have a chorus wave that, that precipitates in this band, how does that electron injection impact gravity waves at that location? But I, I don't think that's a known question yet. Uh, so Jason says, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Grant Berland. Uh, he says, great talk. Uh, do you have an idea of the spatial scales uh, the pose mapping method can capture? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Right now it, it runs um, at two second resolution. Uh, what that means in terms of a spatial scale is about, uh, in terms of footprint on the ground, I think it's, it's something like 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers in footprint. Um, the, the problem is, isn't necessarily with the spatial scale. Um, I think it's gaps. And I'm gonna highlight that. Actually, I'll just show an extra slide if you don't mind. This is a, the current POSE MEPED satellite coverage. Um, and this shows the, the METOP3 is missing right now, but METOP3 overlaps NOAA 15, um, or METOP, I'm sorry. Um, the point is, I'm sure you can highlight where we're missing something right here, right? And that's right here in this noon MLT sector. And that's where NOAA 16 used to fly, but NOAA 16 died in 2013. So in terms of spatial coverage, I think it does a reasonable job. The problem is when you, when you convert geographic spatial coverage to MLT L shell, which is important for magnetospheric wave stuff, chorus waves tend to precipitate here at this noon sector, but we don't see that because we don't have coverage there. Um, so I think, um, I think 
Pose does reasonable jobs spatially, um, especially if you do a daily average like I do. If if I go back to this, um, the mapping that I did right here, this is an entire day of, of five different satellite instruments. So you can see this, this is staring at the south pole, um, but it's in geomagnetic coordinates. So the pole is the, the blank space shown in the white. Um, and it has a reasonable good spatial coverage when you look geographically. Um, and I think especially if you do a daily map, but the problem with that of course, is a lot of waves that, you know, you might not see an entire day of precipitation from a chorus wave or an emic wave, they're gonna be much shorter time scales. So at the, even, even with a daily map and even with the spatial features highlighted, it's still going to be averaging at some point. Um, you know, because this, say, take this line here, let's say. This line probably showed up at three MLT and the one that's going over it showed up at 18 um, MLT or, or, or something like that, right? Where you're averaging two very different time periods. So I don't think POSE has the spatial scale with only five or six satellites to do a sub daily um, mapping. We've, we've tried it, it doesn't work, it gets pretty blotchy. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned, I think there's a problem right now with when you look at um, the, the missing noon sector in MLT, but I think it's the best that we have. And I think it's a useful tool nonetheless because we don't have six satellites measuring electrons elsewhere. So it does the best it can, but I don't think it's perfect. All right, excellent. Uh, Grant says thanks. Um, and I also say thanks, Josh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, this was really comprehensive. Um, our next talk is going to be by Bob Marshall, and he will be continuing the series on energetic electron precipitation and the effects of precipitation on the atmosphere. Um, so I hope to see everyone next week. And thank you again, Josh. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you everyone, have a good week. Bye now.